Well, as always, it's it's good to it's good to be back here at Northwest um, Church. This has been our home church, although not the same name, but this has been our home church for many years. Um, we have a PowerPoint here that we want to sh share with you. Um, some of the churches that we visited, some of the things we've been doing. Cornerstone Church is one of the churches that that we work with in, uh, in uh, San Ignacio, Belize. And uh, the pastor asked all of the dads to come up and pray for the kids. So. The next slide. This is uh, on the island of uh, Keycocker. And you can see the, the blue tarps there. That is actually uh, the pastor's church. It's just spread tarps over the metal framework. Hmm. Here we were uh, handing out t-shirts to the kids. We were really excited about getting getting shirts. Do you have another mic so that yeah, I can right, right behind you. Yeah, so I, I think I told you before that a friend of mine brought me down a Cricut machine, and so I can put designs on shirts. So I've, I've designed hundreds and hundreds of shirts, awesome. maybe over a thousand. Um, okay, next slide. And uh, they had, uh, we did both a, a youth outreach that weekend and a children's outreach. And I'm so excited to see the youth get up in front and they lead and they, they actually do some teaching and they lead worship. And so that's um, exciting to see them stepping up. Um, one of our friends, uh, the pastor's wife, it was her 50th birthday, so we did it up really big, we decorated, and I spent quite a bit of time folding napkins to make them look fancy for her. And we just wanted to really bless her. This is the Nazarene Church where we uh, minister quite often. This is a t-shirt distribution at the uh, school lunch program that's uh, right behind our, our house in uh, Santa Elena. And um, of course the kids were all excited to get a few t-shirts. This is Life Ministries Church and there's quite a few of the branches to this church and so this is the one right in San Ignacio that we minister in. And uh, I was teaching on the principles of tithing and so I did a distribution with with jars and and uh, we actually put our fam our personal budget up and when we were first married and showed exactly what we paid out every month the fact that when we got done we had less money than what the bills came to but we started tithing and the bills were the same the income was the same but the bills got paid every month and uh, one of the a few weeks later, we were ministering at that church and again, and one of the gals came up to us and she was crying and she said, for years I wanted my husband to tithe and he just would not tithe, but she said, after your, your teaching, she said it really took hold in his life and she, she said, he's not here this morning, but he called me and he said, don't forget to take our tithe to church. So she was so excited. Yay. Uh, Jesse, our son, and his wife Muriel came down with the team from Duluth. Uh, this is the second year that they came down. And so um, this, uh, this little church is a little t tiny church in the village of San, San, Juan, um, San Jose. It's up in the northern part of the country. And the pastor, all of his children lead worship. They're from ages 6 up to uh, 14. And they all play different instruments, and they all taught themselves how to play. The husband did not, the father did not know how to play an instrument, did not know how to sing. 
and the kids, the Lord anointed these children, and they're doing such a great job. I tried to put on video on here. I've done it before, and I just couldn't get it to work this time. This is a, a small church where we help them to, to build a bathroom. You know, we don't we don't have a lot of money, but people that ministries that show that they're taking ownership, they are interested in getting something done. They start raising money. A lot of these places, they don't ask us for money, but when we see that, that they're that they're trying to do it, we come alongside them. And, and they didn't even have them. an outhouse at their church. Oh, yeah. So now, now they have a, a toilet with running water. Wow. Did a lot of prayer ministry with the, the team. Various churches. Children's outreach, we did uh, three children's outreaches that uh, in that week. Gave away a lot of prizes, a lot of t-shirts. This is in the northern part called Orange Walk, it's this uh, town. And Jesse was kind of giving this, this young man some advice on how to use the keyboard. Playing games with them. Did a lot of worship, and you have to you have to be instant in season and out of season because they're up there worshiping, and all of a sudden all the electricity went out. So then they came down to the floor. And <laughs> Jesse used his his just used his uh, acoustic. acoustic, and it works. <laughs> This is, uh, we got the, the team involved in the neighborhood feeding program. This is a ministry in a small church in San Ignacio that uh, we minister in quite often. Then our son Jonathan and his family came and it was their first time to be on a mission trip and they were so excited to get involved. A lot of good food down there. <laughs> And so uh, my cousin came down and um, her and her friend helped me make a bunch of t-shirts. But uh, it was Josh Jonathan's first time and we took them, well we took them cave tubing, but then we went over to the property where the, the, the man donated the property to us and we walked the land and, and kind of gave them an, an eye of what, you know, what we're dealing with out there to the local market, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, and, and Addie was so excited to be able to help uh, design the shirts, so we made a bunch with them too. And then we did an outreach in a little small village outside of San Ignacio, little teeny tiny church. And uh, so Their church is so small, sometimes they have enough people, they, they actually open the whole end of the church. They've got like the whole a roof. wall. Yeah, the wall. They move the whole wall back so they can set up chairs outside. Yeah. But Addie got to, she helped Jesse and Muriel lead worship. And then she and I taught the kids a, a song. And so she was excited to be a part of that. This is Mayor Trapp. And, uh, I was just spending some time with him. I, I speak into his life quite frequently, and sometimes he has me come and pray over various things that's going on in the in the city. And so, anyway, that's just a little touch of what's been going on. Turn that one off. So I'm thankful that we're able to be here again today, and uh, for those who do not know, we have sold our house and we are moving away from Superior. After being here in Superior for 34 years, and you know, anybody who's moved knows what a big job it is to, 
to pack up a house and move, especially after you've been in one for that many years. But it's astronomically horrific to pack, to pack up two houses at the same time because not only did I have to pack up our house, but I've had to empty out my mom's house after um, she passed to go to heaven. And so it's been a huge, huge job. But the Lord has given me grace, and uh, we close on her house this week, and we close on our house in a little over a week, on the 15th, in here in Superior, and then we close on our house down in West Bend on the 23rd of July. So our last time to be here at, at New, uh, TPO, other than visiting, will be the 21st of of July, so um, I'm thankful that uh, Pastor Jeremy um, felt like he wanted me to come and speak today, and it was interesting because probably about four or five days before he contacted me, I felt like the Holy Spirit told me that I was supposed to contact him and see if I could come and speak again, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him before I called him, so... Um, so what I'm going to speak about today is about distractions. And, you know, throughout history, we've all seen great possibilities and great potentials that have been out there that have been thrown off by distractions. You know, we get a vision of something we believe God's calling us to do, we start to run towards it, and then a distraction comes. And sometimes those distractions are quite devastating. Sometimes they're small little things that, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's those little jabs that really get us. We can sometimes handle the big, huge things, but those little things that just kind of pick at us, they become a distraction. You know, you can handle someone throwing a gallon of water on your head, no problem. But if you were to lay on the floor and they took a dropper and took the water from that barrel and just kept dropping it on your forehead, how many know that would be a big distraction? That would be very hard to tolerate. You know, so sometimes those little things are what are so huge in our lives. And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 20. And Paul had, pro had prophecies in, in, from all kinds of people uh, telling him about what he was about to, uh, um, what he, the, the different encounters he was about to in, uh, have in his life and the afflictions that were going to come on him. And, but he said, I cannot become distracted by these things. I have to keep running towards the mark. I need to keep fulfilling my purpose. And yet the enemy will come and he'll bring distractions to keep, get us away from doing what God has purposed for us to do. So let's look at Acts chapter 20. And uh, verse, beginning in verse 17. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders. I'm re reading from the New Living Translation, by the way. He sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus, asking them to come and meet him. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day that I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I have never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have, I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessities of repenting from sins and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. So he's talking about these things that are prophesied to him through the Holy Spirit and about tribulations coming and, 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 and in verse 24 we continue here it says here 
but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. There is a pur purpose beyond our distractions. Paul knew this. He knew that, that, that he was going to have a lot of things happen in his life that were, were frustrating and, and, and dangerous and and, you know, he, there were a lot of things that were going to be distractions trying to get him away from fulfilling the purpose that God had for him in his life. And then we go over to Acts 20, verse um, 36 through 38. It says, when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried and they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ships. We'll come back to that in a minute. But there's, there's these things in our life that can continually are, are, we come up as distractions. And in 2 Timothy 4, 6, he writes, The time of my departure is at hand. He was an old man, but he was not... He was not a really old man, but he was not, he was upper there in age. I mean, somebody in their 20s would say that he was old because he was about 60 years old. But somebody, you know, in their 60s or 70s would say, well, he really wasn't that old. A lot of us are kind of in that category, I think. He wasn't that old. But it was the expectation of Paul that he was going to be tried and beaten and jailed. And he said, none of these things move me from my course. None of these move me from my purpose. He knew what his purpose was. And he wasn't about to let that, those distractions, keep him from fulfilling the purpose that God had planned for him. <clears throat> Hopefully that there will be a difference in you every time that you leave church that you'll, you'll receive some type of nuggets that you will carry you throughout the week, throughout the months, throughout the years. Something that you can, you can go back to, and it will encourage you. And that's what we need in our life. Yeah, that's why we need the Word of God, to give us hope, because we're going to have distractions, we're going to go through storms, we're going to go through difficulties. But when we go back to the Word, it brings life into us. It gives us hope. There's something special about coming together. We can encourage one another. You know, and over the years, there have been a lot of people who say, well, <coughs> excuse me, I can, I can worship at home. I don't have to go to church. But they're missing out on that handshake. They're missing out on that embrace. They're mission, missing out on the fellowship. And I believe there's a reason why the Lord encourages us to not, um, not to forsake the fellowship of the saints. We need one another. We need each other's help, uh, testimonies. We need to hear that how the Lord helped you through your distractions throughout the work week. Amen? Because we all face difficulties. And sometimes when we hear how the Lord has helped other people get through their difficulties. It encourages us, wait a minute, God, God helped them. There's hope for me. He, he, he loves me too. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It reminds me of a story of a lady who went to her pastor, and maybe some of you have heard this story, but she said, she said, Pastor, I'm just gonna leave church. I can't stand it anymore. And he says, Oh? So she said, I'm just so sick and tired of, I see people on their cell phones during church. People don't dress properly for church. People are ch chatting with each other during church. And I just can't stand it anymore, all these hypocrites, so I'm going to leave. He says, okay. He says, I, I, I guess I understand your frustration. But he says, will you please come one more Sunday, and then will you do what I tell you to do? Well, she really respected her pastor, so she said, okay, I'll be there. So the next Sunday, she walks into church, and she says, Pastor, I'm here. What is it you wanted me to do? He handed her an extremely full glass of water. 
He says, while I am preaching, he said, I want you to walk, be in the back of the church, and I want you to walk from one side of the church to the other the whole time I'm preaching, and I don't want you to spill one drop of water. So she did exactly what she, he told her to do, and she's walking back and forth, and he's preaching, and the whole time, she's very careful, got her eyes focused completely on that glass of water because she didn't want to drop any. And at the end of the service, he, he, she handed him the glass, and it's pretty full. Good job. He says, well, how many people did you see on their phones? She goes, well, none. How many people did you see talking with each other? Well, none. Did you notice how anybody was dressed? No, Pastor. I, I was focusing so much because I didn't want to spill any of that water. And see, we need to be so focused on Jesus that we do not allow the distractions of what's going on around us to keep us from what God has purpose for us. The devil will bring all kinds of distractions so that we miss out on what God is wanting to speak to us. And that's why we need to come focused on him and what he's speaking to us. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Let the Lord deal with the people who have issues. Because we all have issues, okay? And we can sit there and we can tear apart every single person in the church and we can miss out on the message that the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to us. Often we're so focused on judging other people that we miss out on what God wants to do in our life. Amen. Physical afflictions are a great distraction. And we need to be careful that we do not judge others because they're being distracted by their physical limitations. We don't know what they're going through. I mean, you can have uh, several people at a cancer center going through treatment. And you know what? They still really do not understand each other's affliction. Because every person is in a different place, going through a different type of treatment at a different level. So we really cannot totally understand what a person is going through. Only the Lord Jesus understands our afflictions. Amen. And but the devil uses those as distractions to get our focus off of what the of, of what God wants to do in our life. And, and the thing is, we have a final destination, and that's what we need to keep our eyes on. I'm not belittling in any way physical um, limitations and, and, and what you're going through, um, you know, if you've got a, a physical ailment. But I want you to know that God has the final say. Amen. And you have a wonderful destination if you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart. We have to remember that it's not only happening to them, but it's also happening to those around them. I hate to see people that I love suffering. So many times I've seen, been, been with people and Either they're going through physical, terrible uh, physical um, limitations or, you know, think battles that they're going through. Or they're going through emotional battles or their family battles. And uh, my heart is so heavy for them that I just say, Lord, please, please come quickly because I don't want to see them suffering anymore. I don't like it. I can't seeing people suffer. I want, I want to be that helicopter person that comes down and swoops and saves them. I was just talking to someone recently about that, you know, that, that we want to swoop down and save, you know, our kids from going through things or our friends going through things. But you know what? Unless they go through them, they won't learn to trust God for themselves. We cannot help them we can't teach them how to trust God. We can be an example to them, but they have to experience how they can trust God in the middle of those storms for themselves. <laughs> and sometimes it's the things that I've gone through that have been so difficult that that has brought me to the level that I have 
And I still have a lot farther to go, but I can, I can say, you know what, this is another opportunity to trust God. I don't like this situation. I don't like what I'm going through, but it's another opportunity to trust God. And he has been, been there every time. He is so faithful that I know somehow he's going to help me get through this. There was a story of a professor at a Bible college, and there was a young man in the class who was really on fire for God. And he was, up, he was standing in class, and he was preaching to everybody about how, you know what, you've got to worship God and everything. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You need to worship God. And he, he kind of had this condescending uh, you know, attitude about him, and he started making everybody in the room feel like they just weren't quite the Christian that he was, because he had he had attained at a level of knowing how to trust to 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 worship God in every situation, and they needed to figure it out for themselves as well. And the professor just let the man talk, the young man talk, and at the end, when he was done talking, he says, "Can you come up here a minute?" and and the young man says, well, sure. And he says, yeah, he says, I, he says, I really appreciated, you know, what you were saying. He said, I want to show you something. Can you, can you reach here in my drawer and, you know, pull out that calendar? Well, the young man goes to reach in the door, the drawer, and the professor slams the drawer on his, his hand. And the, the young man says, oh, what did you do that for? And the professor says, Praise God and everything. <laughs> but that hurt. Yes, I know, but you've got to praise God and everything. I mean, we're human, right? We have situations in our life that, you know, it knocks us off our feet a little bit, and sometimes we forget to praise God. But we have to be careful that we don't we don't put that condensation on other people and condemn, make them feel condemned because they forgot to praise God in their situation. We're all, we're all learning. We're all striving to become, but none of us have become. None of us have arrived. So we have to be careful that we're not putting other people down while we're trying to teach them. It's good to give people tools and to teach them you know, how to deal with things in life. But we have to be careful that we do it in love and not in a, a condemning way that makes them feel little. <clears throat> there's, there's, there are distractions that happen to us physically, tiredness, weakness, pain, the distractions are going through um, to, to the point where you feel like, I don't even know how to pray anymore. I've, I've gone, I've, I've come to the Lord, I keep asking, and, and nothing's happening, and we become discouraged, and we lose hope. But I just encourage you, pray again. Pray again. Don't give up hope. This, there has to be something beyond what is going on in our life. Paul said, there's something beyond what's going on in my life right now. He said, I've got to finish. If I get distracted by all the things that are happening to me here in Jerusalem, all he had suffered there was horrible, but there, was, there were more plots to kill him and to come, that he, he knew there was more to come. But he says to Rome, that was the calling on his life to carry the gospel into all the world, and he could not allow those distractions to keep him from fulfilling his purpose. I want joy. I get excited about, you know, what the next thing that God is going to open up for me, the ne next opportunity. But I tell you, sometimes distractions come and get me fo off my focus, off of what the, the vision of what God has told me to, that he wants to do in and through me. And the joy can fade. Anybody ever have your joy fade? Come on, life happens. Our joy fades. But I know where my joy comes from. Amen. And so I look to him. And I, I cry, as I'm crying, I'm saying, Lord, I want that supernatural joy that I can have 
even in the middle of this storm. A joy that I can't explain, but I know that you can give it to me. Going back to Acts 20 that I read, verse 36 through 38, he was saying goodbye to his friends. And, you know, how many of us can you admit that when we're going to go someplace, you know, we're hoping that someone will hug us and say, you know what, I'm going to miss you. It's difficult to say goodbye. And here these people, they're saying goodbye to Paul, knowing that they're never going to see him again, not here on earth. And they were crying and they were, they were, they were distraught over this. Emotional stress, emotional extremes. That's another distraction. Most of you who know me, I've had a lot of physical problems, physical things that have happened to me. Um, some terrible car accidents, that, one that took me out of my nursing job, um, disabled me for a long time. The fall when we were down in Belize where I thought I was going to lose my leg and I was bedridden for over three months. Distractions. Head injury. Did not know if I'd ever be able to preach again. Distraction. And you know, those distractions I actually handled pretty good. I didn't lose hope, really. But then there were some stresses that happened in my life. Some family dynamics that broke my heart so bad. This was just last year where I actually wanted to quit. I told John, every time those other things would happen, I'd tell John, I don't know what, the devil doesn't just leave me alone because I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. But I came really close. I was so, so distraught. Emotional stress. Much worse on me than physical. Distraction. See, the devil knows what distraction he can put in your life that will hopefully get you off your course. The rug is completely taken out from underneath you. That's why we need to be in the Word. We need to have conversations with the Lord, a communication, have that funnel there open all the time so that all you can do, you, it's, it's right there, right, on, right at your disposal. Have that kind of relationship that you can just immediately say, here I am. I'm always telling people, you know what, we sin, but repent quickly. Don't allow something to come. Don't allow forget, unforgiveness to become a barrier so that it clogs up that funnel to heaven, that communication. Because distractions, those offenses, they come and they, they, they bind us to a place where we don't have that conduit, that, that touch of heaven. None of us are immune to these things. But there is one. There is one who will never leave you. There is one who will never forsake you. He has his arm is not too short to touch your situation. He loves you so much. Matthew 14. I promise I've only got another hour going here. Matthew 14. Let's begin in verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. These were experienced seamen. They, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to handle that ship, but they were, they were a mess. They were devastated. Beginning, uh, continuing in verse, 
verse 25. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. When I look at this verse, I see 12 men in a boat rowing in tremendous, you know, in this tremendous uh, storm. And they couldn't get anywhere. I mean, they were just rowing and rowing. They weren't moving at all. And um, that storm, which was holding them back, did not hold back Jesus. He managed to get there. I want you to know he can get there to you in the middle of your storm. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he can make it to, to, you, to your storm, through your storm to you. The storm was they were going through would, would not stop to Jesus. Doesn't matter your lack of finances, that you lost your job, you're receiving, that you just received a, a, a horrific diagnosis from your doctor. A loved, a loved one has committed suicide. Those are terrific storms. But the King of Kings can make it to you to help you through that storm. And continuing in verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. And they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. The storm is still going on. I said the storm is still going on. Amen. But Jesus was there. He doesn't always deliver us from the storm, but boy, he's there. Yeah. He's there to carry us through that storm. He's there to be there with us through that storm. I don't know about you, but my flesh makes me think, if I would have been like Peter, I would have said, well, you know, Jesus, <clears throat> You know, I, I'm not like those guys. I would never doubt you. I would never, I would never um, say anything against you. I wouldn't reject you, Lord. After all, I pray more than all those other people. I'm in church every Sunday. I mean, I tithe. I tithe, I tithe every cent I'm supposed to tithe. And I give offerings. I'm not like them, Lord. But the Lord is not going to let us get by with that. Because he still wants us to fulfill our purpose. And to not go around with this haughty attitude thinking that we're better Christians than everybody else. Because we're all saved by the grace of the Lord. And every ability, everything that I can do that is pleasing to the Lord, it's because of his grace. It's not because I'm so great or that I'm a better Christian than anybody else. I need the grace of God in my life just like my brother who is struggling with an addiction. Circumstances beyond our control easily distract us. It tells us in Galatians 1.10, For do I not persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. One of the greatest distractions that we have to address and to live and walk and, and, and to try to be what other people think we should be. People pleasers. And a lot of times we're distracted from our fulfilling our purpose because we're trying to please people around us. In the ministry, it can be very challenging sometimes because people expect me to do ABC. But sometimes I have to just ignore ABC to do what God has told me to do. And, and people are disappointed because I'm not doing ABC. That was their plan. They thought that I was going to fulfill that plan. But see, if we become people,
people pleasers and always stepping into what they expect us to do and what they want us to do, we'll miss out on what God wants us to do. Galatians 1.10 says, I should be a men pleaser. If I seek to please men, I cannot be a servant of Christ. We cannot allow distractions of people pleasers um, to get into our lives. I tend to be a people pleaser. It's one of my weaknesses because I, I like to be liked. I like to make people happy. Some preach such a strict legalism that people are more concerned about following the pastor's rules than they are about following what God has told them to do. There's so much legalism out there that people are stressed out because they've got to follow all these rules rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them and to, to give them direction. Ephesians 4.15 tells us to speak the truth in love. But, it, but, it, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. That's Christ. So we, we need to, in love, help people through their, their distractions, through their difficulties. But, but we need to do it in love, not bang them over the head because they're, they're blowing it. So yes, we need to preach the truth, not a watered-down gospel that fades for the uh, fades the reason for the blood of Jesus. But we need to bring it in love. We are not there to please men. Paul says, "I have finished my race. I can't let distractions get in my way and keep me from fulfilling my purpose." Circumstances around me, emotional, physical, what people think of me, those are all distractions. And 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Greater is he that is in you. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Again, greater is he that is in you than he is who is in the world. There are distractions on every side, but he will not leave you. If you think you're only staying, if you think he will only stay if you've done everything perfect, then you've missed, you really missed what, what Jesus did for us. Because it's because of his grace. And that's the only way we can fulfill our purpose is by allowing the grace of God to work in our lives, continue to change us. And we have to keep focused on, on our de final destination, our purpose. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love and your grace. How we need the grace. We're thankful, Lord, that you are a merciful God. And we thank you, Father God, that you see us through red-colored lenses. You see us through red-colored lenses because you see how the blood of Jesus has covered us. That's all you see is what Jesus has done for us. You don't see how messed up we are, how easily we get distracted. You forgive us because of what Jesus done, has done through the blood, what he has done on the cross. We're so grateful for the cross, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would help each person here as they're going through their journey, Lord, that you would help them to remember when those distractions come that their hope is in you and that you will carry them through, that you are there with them as they're going through their storm. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Anyone who would like prayer?